did you find yourself when you were in the actual um, stroke process, were you really aware of your mindset or did that come later that you noticed that I had a good mindset just because of my training? Uh, look, I think we all hit rock bottom and, and it does take rock bottom to be able to, I guess, um, put in a positive mindset. And I actually went there, you know, at rock bottom, I was sharing a ward with six elderly stroke patients. Um, it was three months living in rehab. I was told I'd need a year off work, um, two children at home, financial pressures. We were actually living in Auckland, um, which was even more difficult. So we had no family around. So I really felt like a burden on my family um, and hit rock bottom. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. Bill from recoveryafterstroke.com. This is episode 80 and my guest today is Sally Kelly. Sally Kelly is a triple Olympian, coach, educator, member of the Queensland Olympic Education Commission and a disability advocate. Are you a stroke survivor that wants to know how to heal your brain, overcome fatigue and reduce anxiety? By the time this episode goes to air, I will have been eight years into my stroke recovery journey. Three brain hemorrhages and then brain surgery created similar challenges for me. The thing is, very few people understood what I was dealing with. The only people that understood were other stroke survivors. One of the unexpected nice things to come out of my stroke experience is that I have been asked to share my story a number of times in newspapers, in the national news, and as a speaker at various corporate events in the hope of raising awareness and to support other people that are going through stroke now. Most recently, I was involved in the launch of a joint advertising campaign by the Cancer Council of Australia, Quit Victoria, and the Stroke Foundation, which was called Smokes Lead to Strokes. The aim was to encourage more people to quit smoking and decrease their risk of stroke. Being involved in these campaigns made me realize that stroke prevention is important. However, what I needed when I experienced stroke was help to bridge the gap in that critical time when I went home. Realizing that the amount of support drastically declined once stroke patients leave hospital motivated me to create a way to support stroke survivors so that no one has to do it as hard as my family did. If you have fallen in the cracks between hospital and home care and desire to gain momentum in your recovery or do not know where to start, this is where I can help. I will coach you and help you gain clarity on where you are currently in your recovery journey. I will help you create a picture of where you would like to be in your recovery 12 months from now and I will coach you to overcome what's stopping you from getting to your goal. During Coach You, I will also teach you the 10 steps to brain health for stroke survivors and guide you through each step with supporting interviews from experts and information that is based on the latest scientific research. Some of those include training on the type of mindset required for an ongoing successful recovery and how to decrease the anxiety created by the thoughts of another stroke. There'll be a module on emotional intelligence, which will help you manage out of control emotions information about the gut and how a healthy gut is the first step to a healthy brain and we will cover nutrition and the kinds of food required reducing fatigue and there'll be much much more if you're one of the first 10 people to join recovery after stroke coaching you will get a one-on-one -on -one private coaching thread with me access to the course 10 steps to brain health for stroke survivors when released access to member only monthly group training calls and access to the survivors private forum the first 10 people also get more than 70% off the full price of $5.99 and 12 months of access will only cost you $149 per year. Be one of the first 10 people who reply for recovery after stroke coaching now and get the first seven days free. After the seven day free trial, you will pay the annual amount of only $149 and the price of renewal will never increase for as many years that you stay a member. Once the first 10 coaching packages are sold, the price will never be offered again. So take advantage of the seven day free trial now by clicking the link below if you're watching on YouTube or by going to recoveryafterstroke.com slash coaching if you are listening online. Sally Kelly, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Bill. It's great to be here. I've um, been listening to your show and really enjoying hearing um, how other stroke survivors have uh, managed their journey. And it's, um, it's really great to relate to some of those stories. Yeah, it is. Uh, thank you so, so much. I really got, uh, I got curious when I came across your Instagram because you're talking about mindset. 
and yeah. mindset is such a big thing when it comes to stroke recovery and often people's stroke recovery mindset is not is not optimal for a really good healing journey yeah um, before we get started in that conversation tell me a little bit about what happened to you yeah, so um, I had just stepped off the Olympic team. So after three Olympic Games, which was Atlanta, Sydney and Athens, um, which were great successes, um, I stepped off the Olympic team and I guess I was in catch-up mode. Um, I was about 35, 36. So I met my husband, who was a fellow Olympian, produced two children in world record pace. Um, life was hectic. I was playing catch-up mode with a career, a little bit similar to your story, Bill, um, just going absolute skyrocketing. Um, and I was standing in the shower one day after giving birth to my son, Jake, who was all of two weeks old. And um, I just felt a wave of vertigo come over me. My left side collapsed, convulsed. Um, and I just fell to the ground and had no idea what was happening. So um, I had two children at the time, Zach, who was one, and Jake, two weeks old. And I just thought I was living through a stroke. I had no idea. So I went into hospital um, that night, uh, a little bit like your story, actually. I was quite reluctant to go into hospital because I felt too busy to go to hospital, <laughs> um, but went in and did an MRI and they found a genetic brain malformation, so an arteriovenous malformation, so an AVM, which, um, which often is, um, bleeds under times of stress. So likely the stress of, stress of childbirth um, or could have just been the stress of playing catch-up mode as, as we do as Olympic athletes. Um, I was given the advice that I needed invasive brain surgery, um, a craniotomy, um, and they told me the risk was a 15% chance of stroke, paralysis, coma, or death, and that just terrified me. You know, having a newborn baby at home who was just two weeks old, I just didn't feel that I was in a position to undergo a craniotomy. So I made um, a big decision to delay the surgery, um, and delaying the surgery by six months was the best decision I've ever made I've learned more about myself in those six months than I have you know I have in my life because it's a time where you stop and you value life and um, you slow down and you focus on the the quality not the longevity of life and I just spent six months making sure every day counted because you know the following six months there was no guarantee uh, it was just incredible to see every sunrise, every sunset, to um, can reconnect with my children, with my husband, with friends, um, just get back in touch is why we're here. So um, it was amazing. Um, and then obviously the morning of the operation arrived, um, and I'm sure many of your listeners know what it's like to arrive at the hospital waiting for a craniotomy. Um, and yeah, the surgery took seven hours and successfully the AVM was removed. However, I woke up paralysed down one side in intensive care. So I stroked during the surgery. Um, yeah. So I was devastated, absolutely devastated, because I really thought being an Olympic athlete, I was naive. I just thought my body could cope with anything. And I knew my body well enough that there would be no way it would ever let me down. And to find myself as a, an infant in an athlete's body, it broke me. I, just, I lost my whole identity. I guess in a, in a flash, you know, yeah. in seven hours, my whole identity, which was an athlete, was vanished. So I guess that was the challenge that I had. Um, that my whole identity was wrapped up in that physical side, and having to accept that no longer did I have that was a, an enormous um, experience to go through. You know, yeah, um, we we have a lot in common. So I had yeah. I experienced the AVM. I delayed surgery. Um, I went through that process. I delayed surgery for almost three years because um, I, I didn't come across a surgeon who was confident enough, who had mm. the right mindset for surgery. Yeah. And now that we're talking about mindset, that's what it was. And I decided, no, I'm not going with this guy. I'm going to find another, found another surgeon. And that surgeon had from the get go, the right mindset for surgery. They were going to, go in, they were going to get it out, they were going to fix me, no problem. And I thought, that's amazing. Do we have to do it now? No, we don't. We can wait a little while. And um, after the third time that the AVM bled, I decided it's time for surgery. Um, but I kind of didn't decide. By then, the surgeon really didn't want to give me an option. And she really said, look, we've got to do this now because it's getting a bit too risky for you. Yeah. And I had dragged out this recovery journey for three years already and 
you know, the ups and downs, we, we needed to put an end to it. So that's what we did. Um, and it's interesting that those first six to 12 months were the ones that I decided that I'm going to make things good with mm -hmm. family, friends, wife, mm. children, all those types of things in case the next one was a more serious one and I didn't make it or I didn't wake up from surgery. And that was a really good thing to be able to uh, reflect on my previous way of being yes. myself and going, okay, I, I probably wouldn't want to go out of the world and have feedback from my parent, my, my children that goes something along the line while uh, along the lines of dad was, uh, dad was a good dad, but he was angry all the time or cranky or whatever. Yeah. If you've had a stroke and are in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously because you've never had a stroke before, you probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called Seven Questions to Ask Your Doctor About Your Stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Yeah. So, um, so that's the way the, the path I went down. Now you, you're an uh, Olympic athlete. Let's go back a little bit. The rowing team in Australia, whether they're the men's or the ladies, is this massive thing. It's a massive machine that just captures our imagination because whenever you hear about the Olympics, you always hear about the rowing team and how amazing and fantastic they do. And when they're not doing well, you have some really uh, massive headlines as well about Olympians in the rowing teams that don't do well. What is it about rowing in Australia that we go so, that we get so fixated by it? <laughs> Look, I don't know because I guess I'm on the inside of that, but it's an incredibly united team. Um, rowing's a sport that takes huge hours, um, you know, huge commitment. And it's one of those sports, the harder you work, the further you'll go. So I guess the bond, and if you've ever rowed, if people have ever rowed, they sort of can relate to that and understand that and respect that. Um, and I feel like being on the team for 12 years, being on that national team for 12 years, they were part of my family. So it, it's, it is an incredible sport. I've learned so many skills from the sport that helped me through the stroke, you know, the determination, the grit, the resilience, the mindset, um, you know, the, the race is a seven minute race and it's, um, it's all about mindset. It's not about the body. You know, the, the race is not about who's the fittest on the line. It's who's the mentally toughest. And that's what I called on um, after my stroke. Um, but yeah. my story of getting into rowing was quite unique, actually. Um, I was in my final year of high school uh, when a woman came into school when we were sitting in assembly and um, she went around to every school in the state and asked three questions to every student in the state. And that was, are you tall? Are you 16? And would you like to go to the Olympic Games? <laughs> so uh, 400 kids were rounded up and taken down to the QAS, the, the Sports Institute. Arm span had to be greater than height. Power and endurance were tested. Our parents were interviewed. And then those 400 kids were narrowed down to 10 boys and 10 girls and named future Olympic champions. Wow. Now. Um, we were told that within four years, if we did everything right, we'd be at the Olympic Games. So it was quite a whirlwind, a whirlwind experience of discovering a sport and within four years sitting on a start line um, and, and learning all those that four years, those skills of resilience and grit, that delayed gratification that teenagers often don't learn. Um, so many incredible uh, life lessons that you can transfer into times where you go through these obstacles and you can turn them into opportunities. Wow, that is uh, amazing. So that really does illustrate why your identity is this way of being, this person. I am a rower, I'm active, I'm physical, 
I wake up early in the morning, I do this amount of training and I train four years to do a seven minute race. Yeah, exactly. And then repeat that every four years. So <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is my life and it has been my life. But I guess the best thing this stroke did was it taught me that you can't cling to one identity. You have to embrace new opportunities that come along the way. And I do wonder if I hadn't stroked, if my life had gone to plan, what I'd be doing today. Would I still be involved in sport or would I be exploring other areas? Because I think losing your physical ability gives you the opportunity to discover new things, you know, to really get in touch and connect with people, discover new jobs, new opportunities like yourself, your podcasting, you know, you probably wonder whether you would have ended up in this area. And it's, I just think you've just got to open yourself up to new opportunities when these things happen, you know, and uh, close the door on the old one. Yeah, I love it. Mm. Um, you talk about team and how important that is to get to an Olympics and perform and train and motivate each other. I talk mm. about team as well. I talk about it from the point of view of you need a team of people around you to create a successful stroke recovery and to heal your That's brain right. successfully. Now, success is measured differently. So, you know, definitely in Olympic sport, success is measured by whether you finish first, second or third. Fourth mm. doesn't really count, does it? But but if you're a real winner, if you're a real winner, it seems like second doesn't really count either. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, you know, when you go to the Olympic Games, it is all about medals. Yeah. And unfortunately for me, I've raced in three Olympic Games and I've come fourth in every Olympic Games. Yeah. So I left with no medals, but um, a bag full of resilience and grit and determination. And I was so eager to close that door and, and look ahead. So I think that's been quite helpful. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel that that harshness is something that um, motivates you or stops you from experiencing the good that's happening? Because that harshness, of, I finished fourth, that's no good. I mean, that's fourth best in the world. There's that many people that are the fourth best in the world at anything. And you guys get there every, uh, every year and almost go beyond. Um, but in that time, you've won a lot of events. It's not just, it's not like you came forth in every event you ever ran. There's that whole idea of being so hard on yourself that I finished fourth and I didn't get a medal. Um, interfere with other parts of your life? Look, uh, you know, I go back to you say that um, to come forth at the Games, you must have won a lot of events before. I personally feel like I've failed more times than I've succeeded. Yeah. And I sometimes think to succeed, you have to put yourself out there and fall over, learn the lessons. I think we call it um, failing forwards. Yep. You know, I call it turn your failure into frustration, turn your um, failure into into success. You know, really turn it into um, a future, you know, opportunity. So, I feel like I've failed more than I've succeeded, and um, and I think that fourth place was an opportunity to um, go and do something with my life, as opposed to retire on the back of a cereal box like my idol Lisa Curry Candy. Or not, not that Lisa did that, but you know that was sort of my initial thought. I thought, oh, fantastic! I've been talent ID'd in four years. I'll be at the games. I can't wait to pick up my gold medal, rake up the ticker tape parades, and retire on the back of a cereal box. And I'm so glad that didn't happen to me. I'm so glad that I had to have a degree to back up my fourth place. I had to get a job. You know, I had to um, get my feet out there in the real world and really face um, the financial pressures that we all do and things like that because it yeah. teaches you so much. Yeah. Mm. So when we talk about team, I talk about team, including doctors, including physios, oh, yeah. including um, your community around you, including coaches, including psychologists, including everybody that you can go to in a time of feeling um, down or tough or, or during a tough time and say, hey, guys, like, I'm actually not doing well. I need something mm. to help me get through. And I've noticed when I coach people that make that, when they make me part of their team, uh, it, it's designed, that coaching process is designed to get people to have somebody to talk to at their most vulnerable. Is, coach, is being in a team, in a sports team, do you guys help each other get through the tough times as well? Uh, you know, during that training, do you, can you go to your teammates and say, I'm having a really tough day, actually. I need something to help me get through the end of this next training session. Like, how does that work? Mm, absolutely. I, I think your teammates in my scenario have become like my sisters. You know, we see each other at our worst and our best. Uh, we rely on each other. Um, and, and so much so that, interestingly, my rowing partner in Athens, uh, we broke the world record and that Olympic record still stands today. She, um, after the Olympic Games, she moved to cycling. She won the national championships in the time trial, so she went very well. 
and then ended up racing a, a race called the Tour Down Under in Adelaide. And she fell off her bike in the race, um, ended up in a coma for three months and ended up with a major brain injury. So at the same time, I called her up from my hospital bed. She called me up from hers and I said, what are we going to do? I mean, we both couldn't walk. She she had a slur um, and uh, I think the brain knock had caused her vision as well. So she was probably in a worse state than I was. And she said, I've got one word for you, Sally. And I said, what, Amber? And she goes, neuroplasticity. Yeah. Read up on it. <laughs> and from that point on, we both became students of our purposes. You know, we, we took that accountability, that ownership, and together we worked as a team, but also driving the goal, not relying so much on our medical team, but relying on, you know, each other, um, the experts that I guess we could relate to. That's beautiful. Neuroplasticity, mm. that's one of the first things that I came across. And I came across it again because I was curious about, you know, how do I take responsibility for the things that I can? Is there something I can do that doesn't cost money, that doesn't take any effort, yes. that I don't have to do anything about? Because that's how much energy we have, right? We have zero energy at the time of stroking. And, um, and the fact that you guys came together to support each other, had your teammate, yeah you know, by your side and vice versa, going through this thing at the same time, that's that's one of the best things that you can hope for. And some people will feel like they don't have a team around them. That's right. Yeah. Maybe they need to start thinking about how to create the team around them and yes. do it in a way that's very simple, like Zoom or Skype or whatever. You don't have yes. to leave your home if you can't if you can't get up yeah. yet. So yeah. how old were you when you experienced stroke? Um, I'm just trying to, it was actually seven years ago. So it must have been, see, I've almost forgotten it all now. It must have been 36, 37, similar age to you. Um, and I felt like so a young amazing. stroke survivor because I was put into a stroke rehabilitation unit in the public yeah. system. Yeah. And I just felt too young to be there. It almost felt like palliative care. Um, being taught to adapt to my new permanent disability yeah. was heartbreaking. I, I believe things have changed now. We've come a long way with stroke rehabilitation, you know, by always making sure we call it a stroke survivor as opposed yeah. to stroke victim, yeah. changing our language. Um, and I think what you're doing with coaching and I think podcasts, there's so many more resources. When I went through my stroke, I felt so lonely. Mm. I just I had to seek a team because I felt like the team that I was given, yeah. our goals didn't align. Uh, their goal for me was to pick up my child and my goal was to run again. You know, our goals were so out of line and I was desperate to return and they were desperate not to disappoint me. So that's where we were a bit misaligned. So once I got the accountability, the ownership, then I could take my goals and run with it. And I think that's the best thing a team can do is teach you how to be accountable, but support you as you move yeah. through that journey. And it's not like if you if you wanted to run, it's not like if you learned running, you wouldn't be able to hold your child. That sort of would have just come. Yes, that's it? right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think a coach is so important. What you're doing, um, I just, I would have just thrived in that environment if I could have had a coach help me through um, and support me through that, that experience. Uh, and that's what I experienced. I was, uh, mm. you know, Feb 2012, home for six weeks, bored out of my brains and no one touching base and saying to me, just wait another six weeks until your next appointment. And I'm like, yeah, well, there's got to yeah. be something I can do. So I, I called after I was released after seven days the first time. And then by the 10th day after the bleed in the brain, I was with my psychologist and straight into the office there going, uh, somebody needs to tell me what the heck's going on and you need to help me yeah. um, work out how I'm, I'm going to navigate this because I don't know uh, what is happening to me. My life has just been turned upside down and I yeah. need somebody to say it's going to be okay. And I'm happy mm. to pay for you to tell me it's going to be mm. okay. but the hospital, the doctors, all the people there were just happy to, so to speak, patch me up and send me home, make the bed available, um, which I get because there's other people coming through yeah. uh, as soon yeah. as I'm coming, th uh, just as, uh, as I was coming through. So um, I spent, unfortunately, um, my first week in um, a part of the hospital that was for people who had spinal cord injuries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they weren't moving or doing anything. They were just yeah. being supported in every way, shape, or form. And I associated some of what I was seeing to my potentially my yes. life going forward. It was really traumatic. Yeah. I just needed somebody to tell me that it wasn't going to be that way. You know. Yeah. And if I did, and if I did the best I could do uh, in in helping healing my brain and my recovery, um, then I could have a good outcome. Now, I have permanent 
issues on my left side, you can't see them, but I have them. Yeah. Um, they are some spasticity, some um, the numbness, some muscle weakness, uh, yeah. sensitivity to touch, all that type of thing, which a lot of other people can relate to. Um, what are you uh, living with on a daily basis? Yeah, I'm similar. Left side weakness, um, no fine motor control um, on my left side. Uh, and same as you, there's not much movement in my fingers and my toes. Um, hot, cold doesn't really exist, nor um, blunt, sharp sort of pricks and things like that. Um, and, you know, in cold weather, there'll definitely be a limp present. But I hide it really well. I do find myself holding my left hand, you know, when I'm sitting down or um, the best thing, though, I think I'm left side dominant as well. So I do have to pick up a pencil and write with my left side. I do naturally reach for a door handle with my left side. And I've heard that that's a real asset to the to have a stroke on your left side. Um, but I've found sports that have really um, tested me. You know, mountain biking is a great sport for me. You know, your foot gets clipped in, so there's nowhere where you lose that foot. And you have to use that left brake or you end up doing these endos over the handlebar. So, you know, it really puts me under pressure mountain biking. I thoroughly love um, being clipped in, but also knowing I've got to actually respond um, and so much stimulus coming into your body. Um, and it's a, it's a great sport. It's, you you know, are- you've got to find those sports where you can do it and it does test you and stretch you at the same time. Yeah, so your ability to be active and, and still athletic and still relate to that identity that you held on mm. to since you were 16 doesn't go away. And yeah. you see that in a lot of wheelchair uh, sports where you know yes. uh, people who experience injuries uh, end up jumping into a wheelchair and then becoming world's best yes. you know, Paralympian yeah. um, basketball player or something like that and inspire so many people along the way. That's what I love about these stories. You know, they can turn this obstacle into this incredible opportunity and share their story and make it bigger than them. That's, that's the goal for all of us, you know, sharing these incredible stories we have. It's interesting that a lot of stroke survivors decide that that's what they're going to do. They start sharing and start expressing by you going out on stage and talking about mindset to people in the corporate world and wherever else you go and do it. Mm. Does that, is that therapeutic for you? Oh, it's been great. The speech writing, you know, obviously to get up on stage and talk for 30 or 40 minutes, you know, you put a lot of work into the words. It's been great to find the golden nugget in what I thought was a tragedy. So it's been an incredible journey to talk about. It's only, it's, I've only been talking about it in the last year. So I'm seven years post-stroke. So it's taken me six years to get to this point. It's really therapeutic. And I'm writing a book as well whether that book will ever be published, but it's so therapeutic speaking, writing, because you're forced to find the golden nugget and relate to the life skills, you know, that are so important um, when these curveballs come come along. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember deciding that in 2013 that I'm going to go and learn um, how to speak about stroke prevention for the Stroke Foundation. Great. And, um, you know, it was a room of about 20 stroke survivors and, combined we all had you know the brain power of about two stroke survivors because we were, we were all very uh, of two normal people so to speak um because we were all very early on in our stroke recovery yes. journey we didn't yeah. know what was going on it was such an interesting and warm and amazing and fantastic yeah. 20 people who had been through the worst thing in their lives all about now sharing and helping other people so of course you don't know where it's going to lead and I get to talk as a result of that. I got approached to go and do a talk at um, uh, a university, the Australian Catholic University here, that teaches nurses, occupational therapists, oh. physiotherapists, those kind of people. Yeah. And I thought, oh, well, okay, that's going to be interesting. I wonder what they're going to want to know. But yeah. they were third year occupational therapy students getting ready for um, learning about stroke and then starting to go into hospitals to do some training. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, great. What, what will they want to know? And what they wanted to know was how can they be better at being carers for people recovering from stroke? And they wanted to hear from a stroke survivor to tell them what I didn't get while I was in therapy so that they can make sure that they pay attention to those things and support those people. Brilliant. And what did you say, Bill? What was the advice you gave? Yeah, so the advice I gave was just to be really um, gentle, patient, and to be really aware that uh, we struggle with different things, memory, so we need to have Mm. things repeated to us often. Uh, We need to be potentially guided physically, but be careful about touching different parts of the body because sensitivity is an issue. Um, I just talk about the things that they would 
not consider as being um, important for a stroke survivor because thankfully they haven't experienced a stroke and they don't understand. Yeah. And I also spoke about fatigue and the challenges mm. that fatigue created when you know, you're trying to get me to climb those steps or to do that exercise, you know, it might only be a minute's worth of effort that I can put in for that entire day and I'm done. Yeah. The feedback yeah. has been amazing. The lecturers love it because they get somebody who they can relate to, who looks young, who looks physically yeah. normal, um, but uh, is experiencing these things. And I had to spend a month in, in recovery and one of the biggest challenges I had was communication. I felt like, again, and it's always my issue, I felt like people don't communicate enough about what's going on. So the first two or three days, I was sitting there waiting for them to assess me so that I can go into yes. um, the actual physical part of the rehab. And nobody yeah. was telling me. So I had to seek out information from the medical team about why am I still sitting in my room? Yes. Uh, and I haven't been out to rehab yet when I'm here for that. And yeah, they... They, they explained the reason why it was, I was being assessed, but it took three days for me to get that answer. I, yeah. just thought, I just thought that they'd forgotten about me. Yeah. Yeah, the communication's a big one, isn't it? The yeah. communication is enormous because, you know, we want answers. We're, we're ready to go. You know, a lot of us are eager to, to solve this problem and get yeah. some direction. Um, but obviously, there often there's delays in beds or there's um, a public holiday or, or something that slows everything down and, yeah. and that communication is essential. One of the yeah. things that I, got, I gave back as feedback, which I really appreciated being able to do, was the fact that um, I was asked a number of times, what kind of rehabilitation would you like to do? What do you want to achieve? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And that was amazing because I was really afraid of losing my balance and falling over and you know, mm -hmm. hitting my head after the craniotomy. I, I was really yeah. concerned about that. Yeah. And they had a pool on site where I was. Oh, wonderful. So I said, can we use the pool? Because they didn't offer it. I knew it was there. Yeah. And I said, yeah, sure. And we did a lot of the therapy sessions in the pool, walking, floating, swimming, all those types of things. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they asked me was great. And then I remember in outpatient rehab, I was asked, what do I want to achieve when I'm at home alone? After This is after the month um, in hospital rehab. Um, I said, I want to be able to run. And they said to me, mm -hmm. okay, what, what do you want to do, a triathlon or something? I said, no, I don't want to do that. I just want to be able to run across the road in case yeah. there's a car coming. So yeah. I think they're hit. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing yeah. because they yeah. asked me what my needs were instead of assumed that yes. I wanted to do this, that, or the other. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, yeah. I guess that's why I grew my devil horns in my rehabilitation because they knew I had a young, a new child, and they made the assumption that my only goal would be to pick up my child, yeah. and I wanted so much more out of life than just to pick up a child. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They didn't ever quit. You know, ask what's your background, where have you come from, you know, what's your job, how are we going to get you back working again? Yeah. yeah. It was just about being capable to go back home, pick up a child. Yeah. So that's what yeah. I love about that opportunity. And I suppose why I asked you about speaking on stage is to just give people an idea of how you come to finding your passion, because mm. I didn't really know that my passion was being active on a podcast or speaking. It was something that I had to discover um, by stumbling upon more than anything, but by trying different things. And I would yeah. love to tell people who are listening, you know, that part of creating your team is finding a way to uncover what your passion is and yeah. you're going to need support for that you're going to need people to help you and there will be people out there that you can go to and say hey i want to learn about public speaking or i want to learn about That's this right. what's the first thing i need to do and mm. um, how do i do it in a way which is really easy for me to start to learn about that and experience it on a very low scale so i don't scare yes. myself um yes too much when i'm going out into these public forums yeah now toastmasters is a really great option i just started to join toastmasters and it's a it's a huge mix of people from the corporate spectrum to the english as a first language it's english as a second language um there was a stroke survivor there when i was there last it's a great warm friendly place to go to get those that confidence up which is a, a wonderful opportunity but I think um, step one is embracing your difference. You know, that was the first thing, accepting this new identity you've got. Um, that was my biggest jump and my biggest awakening. 
one of the ladies I shared a room with in the rehab, um, she gave me this broken bowl and it was glued back together with a gold glue. And it resembled the Japanese ancient art of wabi-sabi. And she said, even though your body might be broken, um, you need to now embrace this new possibility and let the light shine through the gold. The analogy was just magic. It really gave me a sense of um, this is something I can now capitalise on. I'm different and I need to be proud of this difference and I need to embrace this new possibility. And that was, that was it for me, you know, to have this beautiful wabi-sabi Japanese bowl on my bedside table reminded me that I need to now be proud of my difference and um, open that door up to new possibilities. You and me must have been separated at birth. I, <laughs> I, interviewed, I interviewed a gentleman called David Rowland, who was a psychiatrist who experienced yeah. a stroke and wrote a book called How I Rescued My Brain. Fantastic. I haven't seen that one. I thought look I'd read that. every stroke, stroke survivor book. That is brilliant. And look at, look at the images. Fantastic. The wabi-sabi gold, the gold isn't, glue. Isn't that, that is amazing. amazing? Yeah. And oh, I saw brilliant. that in a bookstore and I found myself just drawn to it immediately because I knew what the image was. Yes, you and then, linked it. And then I saw, the, uh, I saw the title. I bought it immediately. I contacted David and I've interviewed him early on in the podcast okay. series, about yeah. 19 or 20, somewhere there. And um, he shares an amazing story about how he experienced a stroke and one of the challenges that he experienced was, um, again, his identity and the kind of work that he was doing as a psychiatrist was actually making him, um, what was the word? It was making him traumatized. Mm -hmm. uh, some issues with the family created the perfect environment for a stroke to occur. The stroke occurred and now he, writing this book and learning from his experience, he's able to talk to other medical professionals from the oh, point of view of a psychiatrist a big, a big problem is a psychologist from a psychologist yeah. um, about how to approach stroke recovery when they are dealing with people. And his book is yes. one of the ones that is a must read for certain groups of medical professionals all around the world in some uh, parts of the, of the world like uh, England. So yeah. Um, that, yeah. that art of taking a broken vessel and healing it with gold and making yeah. it more beautiful than it was originally yeah. It's such a great an analogy for what it is that we can become as survivors of a traumatic brain injury caused by stroke. Yes, we must redefine perfection because, um, you know, I always felt being an Olympic athlete, it was all about perfection. And when I was lying paralysed in rehabilitation, I had three months living in the rehab centre. I, I just couldn't figure out how to strive for perfection. But once I focused on the progress and redefining imperfection and started understanding that being authentic was actually the new perfection for me. You know, having a, something different, something to capitalise on now that was different. Um, I, I think that was my my milestone. So embracing that wabi sabi methodology is is a really great tip to share. That's just amazing. I really, I just love how your journey has mimicked mine um, in a yeah. couple of ways. It's just really yeah. amazing. It's fascinating. <laughs> So your craniotomy was that February 2011? Did you no, say? No, that was November 2014. 2014, okay. Yeah. So yeah. Um, they uh, decided that they'll go in and remove it then. And um, I was released from hospital around about the same time, uh, around the time I went into rehab. And then I came out of rehab about two days before Christmas um, in uh, December 2014. And then, and then the home rehabilitation and recovery started and yeah it was quite quite the journey to get to there we also unfortunately at that time we lost uh my mother-in-law passed away literally um oh. a week and a bit before my surgery oh that's difficult yeah Very so difficult. tumultuous yeah. time and my yes. wife was going through some really difficult uh life oh. challenges yes um so you talk about uh you know mindset in that time, we weren't actively practicing a positive mindset. Mm. But it was definitely part of what helped us overcome and heal was, okay, well, we just keep moving forward, keep moving forward. And as mm. we move forward, we've then been able to get to a, a safe distance away from the trauma of losing a loved one, brain surgery, le needing to learn how to walk again, all that kind of stuff. And then that distance allows you to look back and then start to heal those traumas and start to yes. 
address them and start to put them to rest? Did you find yourself when you were in the actual um, stroke process, were you really aware of your mindset or did that come later that you noticed that I had a good mindset just because of my training? Uh, look, I think we all hit rock bottom and, and it does take rock bottom to be able to, I guess, um, put in a positive mindset. And I actually went there, you know, at rock bottom, I was sharing a ward with six elderly stroke patients. Um, it was three months living in rehab. I was told I'd need a year off work, um, two children at home, financial pressures. We were actually living in Auckland, um, which was even more difficult. So we had no family around. So I really felt like a burden on my family um, and hit rock bottom. So I had to put some really positive practices in place. Um, I was offered some antidepressants, but I really wanted to have a go at fixing this myself. Um, so I pulled out my Olympic diary, which I called my AWAP diary. So as many wins as possible, A-W-A-P. And that's where I used to write my progress over my perfection. Because when you're at that Olympic level, you only get 1% improvements every day. And that was just like being a stroke survivor. I was only getting 1% improvements. You know, it might have been, uh, I don't know, being able to sit up by myself or being able to use a shower by myself. So everything I wrote down, so it became a gratitude diary. Um, and I think that was fantastic every positive thing that happened to me in those three months I wrote down um, and I started sharing that with my family um, a whole lot of things like that putting positive things I adopted meditation um, focused on what you know we can only con we can only we can't control what happens to us but we can control our response so I'd always yeah. trying to create that time and space between how I interpret and how I respond and I think those three things strengthened me and brought me back to being an Olympic athlete in a stroke survivor unit. You know, the games were 90 days away. London 2012 was only 19, 90 days. So I linked in with a few athletes and I mentally uh, joined their training program. Um, I turned my green hospital gown into an Olympic uniform, just mentally. <laughs> my hospital band became my ID, my wheelchair with my rowing boat, and those elderly stroke patients became my crew. And I just had to brainwash myself and turn that inner critic that we all have into my inner athlete and just go for this like I was training for the games. Because as a mother of two children, I'm sure you've got many listeners out there and you were, you were similar. I just didn't feel like um, I was worth something to my family. I felt like a burden. So I had three months of opportunity and I had to work my butt off to come home and be the mother, the worker um, and the partner, for my husband. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a lot, isn't it? A lot of pressure that we it, have to put on ourselves. It is. And how do you be a... Uh, how do you be all those things when the first thing you should be doing is healing? Mm, exactly. Exactly. Uh, and I think um, you need to focus on your ability, not your disability. Um, and that's why if you're lucky enough to get a spot in a rehabilitation centre, you need to use that time and that space um, to focus solely on yourself. And when my husband and kids came in to visit me, it was so difficult. You know, they were one year old and six months old and, it highlighted all of my disabilities, you know, balloons popping, kids screaming. Um, it was so difficult that in the end, I started to decline going home on the weekends. I declined their visits. I just had to narrow my focus and imagine I was at the Australian Institute of Sport training for the Olympic Games because there was no way I could get distracted. Um, I don't know if you were similar, but the family highlighted how incapable I was and it got to a point where I did have to ask you know to, for three months of just focus to get myself better so I could return home and be I guess the best mother I could be yeah it's a small price to pay three mm. months as and yeah. then after that you're there you're back you're on That's or it. you're much That's better it. than you were I uh it was good the guest the family and friends kind of uh, disappeared early on quite quickly so they came around us they support but because I had drawn this thing out for three years before surgery yes they kind yeah. of all did the visits. They all did all that sort of stuff. So I was left to yeah. my own devices pretty much after I came home. Yeah. But one of the things was that I did find it difficult being around certain people um, and the ones that are low energy, draining kind of yeah. personalities that come in and give yeah. you the old, you know, puppy dog eyes and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, guys, yeah. you, you need to go home. You need to get out of here. I'm tired. Yeah. I need to sleep. That was a real yeah. issue, being able to, um, minimize the contact from those types of people, even though mm -hmm. they had, you know, beautiful intentions, it wasn't what I needed to have around. I didn't need morbidity and all that kind of stuff because we mm -hmm. had just been through that. We had been through that literally yes. 
yeah. you know, a few weeks earlier. And what we needed now was to focus on life and living and staying alive and doing all that type of thing. Um, yeah. And then in our own time, reflecting on what we've lost and sharing those memories and, you know, coming together as a much smaller group with my sister-in-laws and, and my wife and uh, doing that in private and then doing the recovery at a distance from other people, I suppose, is the best yeah. way to put it. Have yeah, distance is right. what I needed. Yeah, I think um, visitors need to leave their sympathy at the door. You know, yeah. there's enough enough sadness going on. And I always said to my visitors, if you're going to visit, bring your lycra because I'll have you doing a job. We'll be walking down the hallway together. You'll be supporting me as I walk um, and leave that sympathy at the door because it just makes you feel lower than you need to, to feel. Um, it's it's difficult, isn't it? It yeah, is. Trying to be grateful and appreciative, but also trying to get your job done. And we're fatigued. We've got a busy day with the occupational therapy and the physio. And trying to fit in visitors um, was quite a challenge. Often something had to go for a visitor to come in. So it was always, um, you know, the visitors did have to come and do a job and help out with the rehab if they were going to come and visit. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's yeah. not about the visitor, is it? It's not about the person coming to see you. It's about you. You're in recovery. You're recovering from a brain injury. It definitely should be about you. It should not be about how they feel, their emotions. It should not be about, you know, their unmet needs, uh, because yeah. they're not getting something back from you they shouldn't be doing yeah. any of that stuff when they're turning up so we love having you there but when you're there you don't even have to say anything you just need to turn up and say give us a hug i love you push you around in the wheelchair help you walk yeah. whatever it is but leave your whole emotional side of it leave it at the door and walk in an, an open yeah. book yeah exactly it is like that isn't it yeah yeah but while in rehab um you know i met some amazing people you know, I'm not sure if you're the same, but it was incredible to connect with people that you wouldn't normally connect with. Um, and a lot of them were elderly stroke survivors and had great stories. Um, you really had deep and meaningful conversations that were quite raw at times, you know, lots of regrets in life as well. So as a young stroke survivor, it was a, a fantastic lesson in life to have a year with these people, you know, three months in rehab and, um, you know, seven or eight months as an outpatient. And just hear um, what an older stroke survivor could give you, you know, and it's all about maximising life and making sure every day counts and not working so hard. And it, it was just an incredible opportunity to learn how valuable and precious life is um, yeah. and to slow down, take a breath and enjoy while you've got your ability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about meditation. You spoke about that a bit earlier and I was wondering about whether or not that was something that you guys were taught to do in preparation for your big events. Was meditation one of those things that was really encouraged or did you pick that up later? Um, it was more in the form of visualisation, which I guess is a type of neuroplasticity. Um, we would always be visualising racing just to get rid of those nerves because the Olympic Games only comes around every four years. So by visualising it, it made it less, less unfamiliar, you know, less foreign. So um, and just eight weeks prior to the Olympic Games, Athens 2004, um, I broke my, well, I fractured my rib while riding my bike. Now, we were the gold medal favourites for that race. Um, so with eight weeks to go, the only person that could see the flip side of that injury was a sports psychologist. And she just said, beauty, it's eight weeks to the game, six weeks to heal a bone. Let's get started on the visualisation. So for the next um, eight weeks, I sat in a boat park with a TheraBand wrapped around a tree and visualised every aspect of the race. Um, you know, so it was perfect in my head. And my rowing partner, she was out in a single scale on the glacier lake um, and our double scale collected dust. So when the games arrived, um, the conditions were incredibly rough. Like they were terrible to the point you could barely row. Um, but we took off off the start. And um, the visualisation kicked in, the fine motor control, the single sculling my rowing partner had done just had us sailing along in this race, sitting on top of the water. And we crossed the line in first place with a world record. So that visualisation really paid off. Um, and then when I was lying on my back in rehab, asking the doctors, when is movement going to return? One of the doctors said, well, why don't you ask how? How will movement return? So I said, well, tell me how. And he said, look, it's a long shot, but maybe you should try visualisation. And I just went, brilliant. That is something I know what to do. So I spent my whole time in rehab visualising the rowing movement and um, just visualising holding the rowing oar in my hand. And what did that feel like? Visualising a crosswind on my face, visualising um, 
I guess, uh, the, the lactic acid in the, the quad muscles, you know, and then it got to a point where I could stand. I'd start visualising movement by squatting, you know, squatting up and down, falling back into a wheelchair or falling forward onto a bed. And that visualisation is what became, I guess, um, you know, the, the reconnection of the neural pathways because they're always there. I just had to reconnect by thinking about the movement. And I say that to other stroke survivors, think about picking up a golf stick or think about picking up your knitting needles and knitting. What did it feel like? And I just think that neural pathway can be reactivated by thinking about such a familiar hobby that you used to do. Yeah, I did an yeah. awesome uh, interview a couple of interviews ago with some uh, neuropsychologist and a lady who was going into her master's of occupational therapy. And we spoke about how memories and neural pathways um, yes. they get rerouted and if they can't be reactivated but they're they're still there and they're still kind of working but not in their optimum uh, way they get rerouted so that they use part of that neural pathway and then they go to another place to just take up space um, in, yeah. in the brain that is not yeah. being impacted by the stroke and in episode 26, I think it was, I interviewed Dr. Michael Merzenich. He's the world's leading researcher in neuroplasticity. I'm saying this again and again. I say it in most episodes. The reason why you need to do what Sally said at the beginning of the podcast is uh, learn about um, neuroplasticity is because that is one of the things that you can do that costs nothing, that yes. is easy to do from your bed, and you can do it when you're not yet moving, when you know, exactly. you're at your weakest, when you're at your most fatigued, you can still do visualization and you are creating neural structures in your brain just as if you would be if you were actually physically moving. Yeah, exactly. It is the same area of the brain, you know, whether you're doing the action or actually thinking about the action, the same pathway is being created. Hence, that's why it worked for an injured Olympic athlete. You know, I was able to perform just as well, if not better, with eight weeks of visualization as opposed to eight weeks of physical training. Yeah, that mindset exactly. is so important. The brain is so powerful, incredibly powerful. Exactly. Amazing. It's what I did as well. Um, it's what I did in those three days when I was sitting in my hospital bed waiting for uh, yeah. the doctors to do something and get me through into the um, occupational therapy area and to the rehab area. Um, I was visualizing myself walking again. Mm, I was perfect. visualizing seeing my hand grasp onto uh, handrail and my foot moving and the way that it would move and then I was also yes. watching videos of other people walking and moving yeah. um, and uh, I was researching um, you know neuroplasticity and interviews about neuroplasticity and learning about it uh, just on a computer on wi-fi yeah. if you haven't got a computer get yeah. one of those visitors who are coming to see you yes. to make themselves more useful by bringing a computer and letting you use it while you're in rehab that's right um, so all those things all come around creating this beautiful way to get to supporting yourself in a stroke That's right. recovery and not relying on other people to give you all the answers. That's right. That is the key. The accountability, the ownership equals empowerment. Once you start feeling empowered, like this is your your problem and you need to find a solution, I think the growth begins. So the audio book, uh, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doig, I think many of us have heard that. Um, I did the audio book while I was laying on my back and yeah. the stories are remarkable. Yeah. And he talks about CI therapy and that was a big one for me. You know, if you can strap your good side to your body and use your weak side, even if you can't open that door handle with your weak side, at least you're thinking about trying to move that left side. And I think the, the pathways that you are creating just by thinking um, is the first step to getting that arm or that leg to move. Yeah, and he references people like Paul Backy Reader, I believe. He references mm, people he like Dr. Michael Merzenich, and he talks about all the stuff that was being discovered in the early 90s about neuroplasticity. Um, Norman Deutsch really beautifully puts it together in a, a form that enables people to, what's the word, that enables people to grasp the concept of neuroplasticity mm -hmm. because yes. he shares that information in stories about how yeah. patient X did this and this is, you know, this is the research that backs up what patient That's X right. did. It gives you so much hope when you're in a position where you're paralysed on one side of your body. There's so much hope in that book. You know, it really makes you believe with the science and the scientific research that backs it up. It's um, incredible to know there is an opportunity out there. Yeah. 
as we start to wrap up, we're coming to the end of the podcast, but there's one area that we haven't touched on yet, and that is nutrition. Yeah. Now, you would have been in the box seat to have your nutrition sorted because of the the immense knowledge that you would have had about how to fuel your body for uh, a certain outcome, which is to perform really, really well. How did that understanding of nutrition support you later on when you discovered that you needed to heal your brain? Yeah, look, nutrition has always been good, um, good foundations as an Olympic athlete, um, and I've never changed that. Uh, The protein aspect, I think, when you're using so much um, brain power, when your brain's recovering, was quite essential. Um, And obviously great um, nutrition, a lot of water, um, you know, less alcohol, less coffee and less sugar, which is a really big one, which I know you're you're quite passionate about. Um, The sugar really did knock me around um, and uh, so did the caffeine. So I really had to back off those sorts of things. Yeah, Yeah, they they put the body into um, a heightened... Uh, space of stress and makes you yeah. uh, makes you use more energy because uh, they're a stimulant. So they're stimulating you when you're not being active, and it's a different kind of stimulation than it is if you're being active and you're using your body to stimulate yourself. So yeah, usually correct. people find that dip afterwards really difficult to deal with, and they some people don't associate the dip with what I had before the dip, which was the caffeine. And if you have coffee. Uh, with sugar then it's a double acting stimulant Um, and it can take it takes you kind of like to that stressed level without you really realizing that you're there without you knowing it and then once you get off the sugar and the caffeine for a little while what you notice after you do try and have a caffeinated sugary drink is a completely different experience in your body your body will really go hey i'm noticing this and when i have caffeine now, I really notice the buzz, and I have a very rarely. I mostly try and have decaf. and um, But particularly when I have sugar, I actually feel it coursing through my veins. I actually properly mm. feel it. And then it goes mm-hmm. into my head, and I can actually tell you, oh, my God, it's just gone through my heart, and it's gone up there, and it's in my head now, and I can feel it. Yeah. Um, and that's not information that I had before, uh, before I quit sugar because it was always mm. in my body. I didn't ever know the difference. So if you're curious about nutrition and you want to do something that's really good for healing the brain, again, without any effort, quit sugar. Mm. Mm. There's so many there's so many life-changing things that occur after such a, an obstacle that we've all been through. You know, there's so many opportunities to upgrade your life um, after this experience we've been through with the mindset, nutrition, um, connection with people, uh, you know, creating that time and space in your day, not rushing around, changing careers, I just think there's um, every stroke's different for everyone, but really there's got to be a golden nugget, nugget for everyone. I think everyone's got a story, um, and it's up to everyone now to find that golden nugget. Of Are you one of those people? Upgraded. Yeah, I agree. Are you one of those people that can say the stroke's one of the best things that ever happened to you? Looking back. Yeah, I am actually, but I'm one of the lucky ones because um, I'm still. Yeah, I, I I do say that, but I say it very carefully because I'm yeah. quite fortunate. But then I think life is a choice as well. And I know when I first was found out I had an AVM, the doctor sat me down. He said, you've got 15 seconds to, to decide whether you're going to be a victim or a survivor. He said, I'm, what I'm about to tell you um, is going to change your life. And you've got 15 seconds to commit to being a victim or a survivor. And then he went on to tell me how this was going to impact my life. So I remember making that promise to the doctor then. And I've never looked back that um, this thing is going to um this thing's going to change my life, but it's going to change my life for the good because we can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond. And that yeah. is the most important thing in life. Yeah. And I, and I don't say, and I don't say that if you're a stroke survivor, you must have uh, be able to get to the point where you can say strokes, the best thing that ever happened to you. Oh, I'm very comfortable. If you can't say that um, it makes mm. complete sense for a lot of people. Um, I'm just talking about, it's not the best physical thing that's happened to me. It's not the best financial thing that's happened to me. It's not the best, mm. It's the best thing with regards to my mindset and with regards to how I've grown from that and how I've mm. seen life and how I've changed the way that I live my life. And, you know, it's not got anything to do with I'm a crazy man and I need bad things to be happening to me and therefore I love it. No, it's not about that. It's about what I've learned that I never would have learned. It's what I've experienced that mm. I never would have experienced. And it's not only that, it's how I can relate to people that are um, in a difficult state 
that mm-hmm. I couldn't relate to before that I was completely oblivious about. Mm-hmm. And I used to Compassion, see Compassion, some... empathy, yeah. those sorts of, you know, character traits that you weren't able to capture until you've been through this experience. Yeah. yeah. And and how proud you are to have um, survived such a such a tragedy and come out the other side in a strong position. You know, I've raced in three Olympic Games, but I'm more proud at how I managed my attitude through a stroke than I am through three Olympic Games combined. Because it's taken more mindset, more strength, yeah. more mental strength to get through such a thing that we've all been through. Yeah, beautiful. What is in store for the future? What's the next big thing that you're working towards? Because you're definitely working towards something big. Oh, look, I just want to make this story bigger than me. Uh, I think it's great to share our stories, um, find the golden nuggets. Um, I'm an educator, so I love talking to kids about the importance of growth mindset, um, delayed gratification, because um, not that I talk to the kids that there's a curveball coming along, but life brings curveballs. And I think if we can, if the kids that I educate can have a strong mindset, a great growth mindset, um, understand delayed gratification, then they will be they will find life easier later on because they'll have those transferable life skills ahead of them. So that's my goal, to share the word, um, but also, uh, you know, ensure that all kids that I teach um, are strong, resilient kids. Yeah, that's beautiful. We have spoken about some amazing topics. We've spoken about mindset, identity, team, embracing your difference, gratitude, meditation, delayed gratification, accountability, resilience, nutrition, I mean, what a we have covered a lot, say. Bill. <laughs> we might have to do another one. We, in a year's absolutely, time. Yeah. absolutely, we should do that. Uh, I want to thank you for being uh, on the podcast, firstly, but also I want to thank you for um, sharing your story the way that you do through your community. Um, if people want to find out a little bit more about you, where can they go? Uh, Instagram, Facebook, um, and I have a, a website. So, would love to talk to any other survivors. I think we need to be a team. Um, we've all experienced something similar um, and this is a journey um, every day we're always looking for that next one percent so if we can get that next one percent together um, that would be incredibly empowering so yeah, we'd love 1%. to stay in touch absolutely mm. we will um, sallykelly.com is the website it's s-a-l-l-y-c-a-l-l-i-e.com And we'll have all the links anyway in the show notes to all the socials and all that kind of stuff. Sally, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Bill. It's been an absolute privilege. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.